Monarch, Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. But if you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch, Legacy of Monsters. Streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Some things are just better together. Like party playlists and Friday nights. Campfires and ghost stories. Peanut butter and chocolate. And Reese's Cups are the perfect combination of creamy peanut butter and delicious milk chocolate. So, when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Buy Reese's today wherever candy is sold. Hey, hey. Okay, so you guys know that I've moved my platform over to Patreon, and that's patreon.com slash Jamie Glowacki. So everything is moved there. That's where I'm now housing all my parenting content. For a dollar a month, you can access all the episodes of my podcast, but no worries if you don't want to do any financial commitment at all. We'll continue to release selected episodes here on your favorite listening platform. And just so you know, I also put up free public posts and mini podcasts on that Patreon page. So all you have to do is head over to that main page, patreon.com slash Jamie Glowacki, and you can see my free public posts and mini podcasts. Head over there to check it all out. And now on to today's show. Hey, I'm Jamie Glowacki, and you are listening to Oh Crap, I Love My Toddler, But Holy Fuck. This is a podcast for conscious parents who drop the F-bomb a lot. Hey, welcome, welcome. As always, I thank you for being here and I thank you for your support on Patreon. So today I want to talk about homeschooling because I'm getting a lot of questions about homeschooling because, of course, we're starting to discuss how schools are going to open with coronavirus still sort of looming over our heads. People are making choices about this based on a few things. And of course, this totally depends where you are and depends on how your school system is going to operate come September. And I'm hearing so many different scenarios. So bear in mind that your particular scenario may not be mentioned here because I just don't know about it because there's so many. But what I'm hearing a lot is, especially with our little guys, is the restrictions they're talking about right now aren't even resembling school. And because of the distancing, they're taking away almost every social fun aspect of school. And let's face it, very few kids are like, yay, I can't wait to sit and do hardcore academics all day. Most of the reason kids like school is because they're with their friends and they have recess and lunch and they get to be social with their friends. Um, So the distancing restrictions that some people, some school districts are talking about are quite restrictive and kind of taking away all the fun of school. And I've heard from quite a few parents whose kids are going into kindergarten. And of course, that would be your kid's first formal school experience. And they're like, I don't want to send them under these conditions. This isn't even school. This isn't even fun, you know, and you might have like a great elementary school in your neighborhood. And, and you're like, oh, we were so looking forward to this. But now it looks like something completely different. And of course, some people have just figured out that like how they did distance learning, you know, whether or not their kid did well with distance learning or didn't do well, they're figuring out that like, hey, I like to have my kid at home. We did our academic work really quickly or we discovered all this really cool stuff together and all of a sudden homeschooling's on the table. And of course, for a lot of parents, they have figured out or their bosses have figured out or their job has figured out that, wow, okay, maybe I actually can work from home and maybe homeschooling is all of a sudden on the table. So it's been a question that I'm getting quite often. So I just wanted to go through a few things and some major questions that I am receiving. Now, first and foremost, I need you to understand that nobody was homeschooling from March 19th is when our schools closed in Rhode Island here. And, you know, I think pretty much the whole country closed somewhere around that time. So for March, April, May, and June, none of us were homeschooling. You were 
doing some schooling at home for sure. And there was the digital learning, the digital experience, but I call what we were all doing crisis schooling. So even me, who is a hardcore longtime homeschooler, unschooler, this is not how we homeschool. Real homeschooling utilizes museums and resources. Uh, Kids are out in the community. Kids are with their friends. Kids are doing group projects and co-ops and 4-H and Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and all these various things. And so none of us were actually homeschooling. We were crisis schooling. So if you feel like, okay, I dipped my toe into the pool of homeschooling and now I'd like more, good for you. But please understand that that's barely even dipping your toe in the water, though it was not the right homeschooling water. (laughs) And homeschooling looks so much different than what we just did. So I just want you to know that. And one of the things that drove me crazy hearing from friends and from clients and from, you know, just the general populace is how many schools and teachers really just tried to mimic a whole school day via digital learning. And there's so much that goes into a school day, you guys. There's so much. I would argue that there's not a whole lot of socialization, except that you are in community with with your people for the kids. But there's so much crowd control. There's just so much managing, you know, 20 to 26 kids. And that's on average you know, with one adult in the room and there's a lot of sit down and line up and be quiet. And of course, in the actual learning, teachers rightly so have to play to the the lowest denominator, right? Make sure that everybody understands. So so if your kid really understands a concept, they're going to be kept a little behind while, you know, the teacher makes sure everybody understands the concept. So there's a lot of repetition and there's just hours and hours that, you know, if you're doing academics at home, it's going to look very different. And so for elementary school, it's really like an hour, maybe an hour and a half, maybe in fifth grade, two hours, but very nowhere near a six hour day. So that sort of drove me crazy. And so you need to know that right away. If you're even considering homeschooling is that the actual academics just don't take as long as a school day. And that that it was trying to be mimicked through the digital learning was kind of asinine (laughs) because, you know, also what kid, like if you think about all the times they get up and move around and recess and lunch and go to the bathroom and those kinds of things, you know, to sit in front of a screen and Zoom meetings isn't by by far the same. And I know everybody had a different experience, so I'm being very general here. And again, I'm saying all of this based on what I have heard from clients, community, my personal experience and my professional experience. So if this isn't your scene. You don't have to write to me and be like, that's not true. That's not what happened with my school. Cause I know there were like fabulous experiences. There were horrible experiences and we really did run the gamut. So I, I totally understand that. So the major questions I've gotten are, is homeschool legal? And what do I have to do to homeschool? Do I need to be certified? And under that is all kinds of things like, can I teach other people's kids? Can I start a co-op? A big one is what curriculum should I use? What curriculum do you use? What curriculum is out there? And then the last component was, you know, digital learning didn't go well for us. What should I do? Digital learning did go well for us. What should I do? So I just want to hit those major points. And there's a lot under each one. So first and foremost, and the most boring category, I would say, is is homeschool legal and what do I have to do? This is a complicated question because every state has their own laws and their own rules. And sometimes even within a state, their rule is that they leave it up to the city or town. So it's really difficult. And I am not well-versed countrywide, you know, nationwide on all the rules for every state. What I would say is you can absolutely Google, but I would say find a veteran homeschooler, find a group in your area and go to them. Even if you don't want to join the group, go to them for advice on what you need to do for your town, your city, your state, and what you need to submit to the school department is usually who you submit to. It's really important that you do this because if you Google or if you call the school, you might get in touch with somebody who doesn't quite understand the homeschool law and they might have an opinion about homeschooling and school departments don't get to have an opinion. Yeah, they can make sure that you're doing a good job. There can be some oversight and regulations, but they don't get to have an opinion that like, I don't agree with homeschooling. That doesn't play into it. And so sometimes, you know, if you call the school, you can get a 
a secretary or somebody who's judgmental about homeschooling is going to give you the wrong information. And this is really vital because homeschooling is it's your constitutional right to direct the education of your child. And we all know that like in a lot of areas, mine included, that schools are going to hell in a handbasket. If you have good schools in your area, great. That's awesome. I'm not anti-school, but I am anti-bad school. <laughs> so we want to make sure that the homeschooling laws stay intact. And if you start getting wrong information and people telling you you have to submit X, Y, and Z when you really don't, what you do is you sort of change the common law and you change the expectations. And if you listen to my other homeschool ex episode, I'm just wildly against the legislation of parenting. And a lot of homeschooling stuff falls under that. And you'll hear people, you know, say, well, I knew this homeschooling family and they kept their kids in the basement and, you know, they, they, ate their young. You know, you hear all kinds of weird homeschooling stories. And whenever, you know, I look at the terrorist kids who have shot up schools, you know, it, they're almost always homeschooled. You just kind of hear this like really negative thing. And so you want to be really cautious because I feel like homeschooling is one of those things that is very, people are very quick to try to over legislate. And it's sticky ground because we want to keep, we want to keep the laws as they are. So again, if you get wrong information, you might be tempted to oversubmit to prove what a good parent you are, to prove what a good teacher you are to your kids, but then you sort of skew the whole law. So that's the number one. And also just finding groups in your area can be so helpful when you're starting out because this is a big, it's a big step. And, and again, if you listen to my other episode, it's not a step that I was like, oh, 100%, I'm homeschooling. I threw up every night trying to make this decision. So it can feel really, really scary. So a group can super duper help with that. They can tell you, you know, the law, they can share curriculum. A lot of times there's co-ops. Most areas have a religious group as well as a secular group. It depends where you are. I've heard like in certain states, it's really hard to find secular groups, but at least the religious groups can kind of teach, you know, if you're not into a religious group, if you are, great, but any group can point you in the right direction for some of this stuff. I will give you an example. So Rhode Island is a quote unquote approval state. So our homeschooling has to be approved. But again, this is a, a funny category because people on the school department start to think or the school committee who they actually see your letter of intent. And that's what we have to do in Rhode Island. We have to send in a letter of intent that just says, you know, we plan on following the law. We plan on following the statutes of education. And then at the end of the year, we send in an end of year report, which is simply that our child has met their educational goals. So we don't, we're not required to send in, uh, we don't have testing, which is great because a lot of people opt into homeschooling because they want to opt out of the, the crazy testing that's happening these days and teaching to the test. So, but in Rhode Island, I was on an advocacy team for homeschooling and each city or town kind of had their own version of this. And, and they would get skewed again, thinking that approval meant that they get to approve of whether or not people homeschool. And again, you don't get it. They don't get an opinion. So the letter of intent, if it's properly written, is supposed to go before the school committee. They just stamp approval and then we're all set. Now, the state law in Rhode Island is that each city and town can choose their policy. So again, not overstepping the law. A lot of schools, uh, districts don't realize that that means that policy refers to like, can, you know, could Pascal go into school and take a science class? Because some districts allow that. Can Pascal play sports on the, the school team? You know, the reality is I pay education taxes and I'm happy to do so. I, I want our society to be educated. So I pay taxes, even though my child's not part of the school system. So he does get to utilize school in that way. And depending on your district, there's a lot of, you know, your child can go in for, for science or art or gym or something like that. So that's policy. But some school districts overstep and think that the policy means they get to, again, have an opinion about your homeschooling. So that's how Rhode Island works. I know Pennsylvania is a testing state. So like you do have to submit tests at the end of the year. Every state is different. Again, I can't overstate this. <laughs> find a group or find some veteran homeschoolers. And, you know, you can look on Facebook and sort of type in various groups for your area and you'll pull up something. Or even if you pull up general homeschooling groups, a lot of times there's an advocacy team that can help you negotiate the, the rules and laws in your particular area. There is a, 
a organization called HLDA and it's Homeschool Legal Defense Association. And they are, they do have a religious slant to them, but they are the only legal defense association in the country. So if you run into trouble or you feel like somebody's overstepping, you guys, nobody should ever go into your home. So if somebody says, oh, we're going to come out, we're going to come out to your house and check out your homeschool environment, that is not legal. So, you know, make sure again, that you know the law and that there is a legal defense a team of association you have to pay. I think it's like a hundred dollars a year, but that is available should you need to. Again, it's your constitutional right to direct your child's education. And, you know, I just think in general, we're over legislating everything. And is there, you know, are there shitty homeschoolers out there? 100%, but there are 100% shitty parents out there. And so homeschooling is not a, it, it's not a place that we over, have to over legislate. You know, it really, it goes up my ass sideways when I hear people say, well, who's, you know, somebody needs to watch out for the children. And I think that's, you know, yes, we as a community, we all have to watch out for children. Mandated reporters, absolutely, we should be reporting abuses. But the idea that we need somebody checking up on us, I, I just, that goes against my absolute freedoms. <laughs> and I don't love that. Um, that's overstepping by the state. And I, I don't, I don't love that at all. All right, next up, do I need to be certified? And under that, again, can I start a co-op? Can I teach other people's kids? No, you do not need to be certified. You do not need to be a teacher. I firmly believe that we don't have to be the sole teacher of our kids. In the elementary years, you, you probably will be, but I am hugely into being a facilitator of my child's education. And I don't want to repeat myself because I think I already said this in the homeschooling episode I did earlier in season one, but I am, as Pascal grows, I am more and more a facilitator. So like, dude, he's in like way higher sexy math that is way beyond me. So he has a tutor. He has a tutor who loves math, who's really into it, you know, reasonably priced. There's a lot of people doing homeschool tutoring for real reasonable prices. And so we don't. I'm in charge of his social justice education right now. And we're like digging into movies and, and Wikipedia and, and trying to figure out the shit we don't know we don't know. <laughs> so so I'm a facilitator. You don't have to be like a teacher, you guys. And you don't have to you don't have to sit at a, a desk and and impart information into your kid. You get to you get to grow and learn and be with them. And I always say this, like everybody is homeschooling from like zero to five. Like you are, you don't come home. Even if you work full time, you don't come home and plop your kid in front of a screen. Like you learn with them, you read, you get excited. You're, you are watching their growth and you're facilitating their growth. So don't be afraid of that. It's such a weird concept that like you can totally do this with ease and grace you know, till they're five. And then all of a sudden in kindergarten, you are now incapable of teaching your child. Now a professional must do this and and that's it. So certainly there are ages and places where it will behoove you to have somebody else teach your child. But in general, when we're, st when we're talking about preschool and kindergarten and first grade, you are more than capable of doing this. I am a hundred percent sure, particularly you know, if you're listening to this podcast, you care about your parenting, you are absolutely in the upper echelon. Now, a lot of the groups will have co-ops. Co-ops, they're awesome. They're they're more like a social thing. I know our secular group here in Rhode Island, I sort of veered away from them when they started doing a co-op that looked a lot like school. I didn't take my child out of school so he could sit at a desk and, you know, learn for 50 minutes. That's that's just not my, my cup of tea. But co-ops can be a wonderful opportunity. You can 100%, you know, other people teaching your children is really up to you. I, I guess I can't speak for every state in the U.S., but I know in Rhode Island, like there's nobody's watching over that. So it's up to you if you feel confident that, you know, somebody's leading your child's education then that's your that's your prerogative. You can do that. Now, there's no formal, the co-ops don't count as school. Like if you wanted to start a school that was accredited, that's a different thing. And there's all kinds of charter schools popping up and Anki and, and all different kinds of styles. So, but that's a different animal. Uh, certainly a lot of parents, especially working. And I know even right now, because parents are doing like their Zoom meeting work and that kind of thing, What's happening is, you know, one mom will take three or four kids and do like science experiments or another mom will take the kids and do like outside stuff or the dad will do, you know, uh, some sort of outdoor activity or some sort of 
math lesson or something like that. So you can 100% do that and, and no, you don't need to, you know, I wouldn't say anything to anybody on paper, but you, you can do that. Again, I think it's about if you feel confident that whatever situation you're putting your child in is the right one for them. A big question people always ask me is about curriculum, curriculum, curriculum. Now, I want to say that there's kind of a big issue in this particular time, if you're considering homeschooling, this sort of goes in general, but mostly because we're still dealing with pandemic conditions. So people always ask about curriculum. And I understand because it makes you nervous to just kind of wing it. So I think so you have to really look at why you're choosing to homeschool right now. So are you choosing to homeschool because the restrictions are so crazy that you just kind of want to take a year off or you kind of want to not be tied to whatever decision they're making. I know a lot of schools are looking at like two days a week with digital learning on the side. There's all these crazy combinations being talked about and maybe you just want to ditch out because it all feels very overwhelming or your kid didn't do really well with the digital learning and you're like, well, fuck it. I'll just stay home for a year. Here's the deal. And I always hear this from parents, you know, I'm going to try it for a year. Or a lot of parents will say, okay, we're going to try it over summer break and we're going to see how it works. None of these are actually homeschooling. So I don't love the idea of trying homeschooling for a year because what happens is you are, if you're going to try it for a year and you think you're going to put your kid back in school, and this includes the current pandemic conditions, if you think you're going to homeschool just for this year and then send your child back to school, you 100% are tied to the school's curriculum because you have to your child has to quote unquote, keep up. And that is my least favorite phrase in education. Keep up, keep up, keep up. That is a treadmill and it's, um, it's a grind. And I don't like it because it doesn't open the doors to true learning, to juicy learning, to, uh, suiting your child's education to you, to your family and to your child. So just know that. And it's important for you to know because I, you do, and, and regardless of how I feel about it, you have to keep your child up because they're going to be going into the same, you know, the next grade with their peers and they need to absolutely have the same information. In that case, you might as well, you can get books from the school and you can borrow them. So you might as well just do that and do it at home. Again, it's not my favorite way, but the that's the reality is you don't, you really do have to stick to their curriculum. And when people say like, oh, I want to try, I just want to try homeschooling. We're going to try it. This this one cracks me up. February break, Christmas break. Oh, we, we tried to homeschool. Guys, you can't try to homeschool for a week. It's not the same. If your kid is in the system of school, they're in that system. That's what they know. You're not homeschooling. You're, you're doing school at home and it's not the same. Homeschooling takes a long time to like settle in, to figure out what kind of learner you have, to figure out your style, your kid's style, your day, the rhythm and routine of your homeschooling life. What does it look like? You're not going to figure that out. Doing worksheets that the school sent home on Christmas break is not homeschooling. Trying to homeschool during the summer, also your kid, it's your kid's fucking break, man. Why would you attempt to homeschool? You know, and I, I would argue that we're always all homeschooling, you know? And again, one of the things that fucking pissed me off about this, this like the school's closing is that it was such a rich opportunity to dig into other things. I was like, why didn't they send that list of like 50 things your kids should know before they leave your house? And it's like how to bake bread, how to tie a tie, how to sew a button, these kinds of things, you know? I was like, why, why did we just do worksheets? <laughs> it's like crazy. You know, why did we sit there on Zoom meetings when there was so much life that could have been happening? But I digress. Monarch, Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives but if you come with me you'll know everything i promise oh my God, go, go, go. monarch legacy of monsters streaming november 17th only on apple tv plus so once you decide that you know that's gonna that's gonna lead your decision there are so many choices when it comes to curriculum that i would not even be able to scratch the surface and it's not my area of expertise i will say this there are literally thousands. You can 
spend so much money on curriculum and I have, and so have all my friends and everyone I know who homeschools. You can get curriculum secondhand on eBay. So I suggest that. I would say stay away from all in one. So let's say you love the Waldorf style and Waldorf, you can order Waldorf style education, like curriculum, like all in one so that you get all the subjects and and teacher script and all of this. And that sounds really appealing to some people, but they're very pricey. And time and time again, the curriculum doesn't match the child's style. And so then you're fucked. Then you've spent so much money on curriculum that doesn't really work or that your kid doesn't doesn't resonate with. And, you know, for example, Pascal, when he was, I took him out of first grade, he loved worksheets. My kid was like, (laughs) it's really funny because I'm such a whack job, but even as a preschooler, he only would draw in old calendars, like in the little boxes. He was literally in the box. And I am so out of the box that this was like, what the fuck is going on with my kid? (laughs) And he loved worksheets and Pascal was always a rule follower. And so, you know, when I took him out of school, I was like, oh, this is going to be easy. I'm, he's such a rule follower. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get worksheets. I'm going to, this is going to be easy peasy. And it was not. Once he was out of the school environment that he was a rule follower, he was just going to do whatever the teacher said. But once I gave him the grace to sort of discover his own learning, he hated worksheets. I had to throw out all the red pens and pencils because he like would have an anxiety attack of, of having things wrong. He was a nervous learner. He would erase things till there was no more paper. Very nervous learner. I didn't know that when he was in school because his rule following took precedence. And so there was this huge learning curve. And one of my homeschooling mentors, uh, just the best thing ever, she said, you know, if you're crying, it's not working. If he's crying, it's not working. And if you're both crying, it's really not working. And that was like my mantra. And it didn't mean homeschooling wasn't working. It meant that whatever style I was choosing, whatever curriculum I was using wasn't working. And there's so many fucking options, you guys, that you don't have to be stuck with one. So if you're getting this like massive resistance from your kid, if, if your kid is crying, try something else. There's so many ways you can, you can go with this. Number one, and this is like, I think we're, well, this episode is going to be long, but that's okay. You have to figure out what style your kid is. Um, there's kinetic, there's visual, and there's auditory. Those are just some broad generalizations. And so for example, Pascal is a, a auditory and kinetic learner, not visual. You can show him graphs, you can show him pictures. It That doesn't hit him. If I put headphones in him, it's like osmosis. The information goes like right into his long-term memory. It's almost freaky. And then also kinetic, he likes to move as do a lot of boys uh, and girls too, but especially boys, they can learn on the move. So like, for example, he learned all his math facts, all his times tables on a balance board and he got it like a a slapping, he would um, tap his thigh as he was learning his math facts. And this is how he does spelling too. He would tap his thigh while he was on a balance board. And then when he was off the balance board, you know, maybe taking a quiz or maybe trying to recite the facts back, he could tap on his leg and it brought up the muscle memory. And so that's a kinetic learner. So if your kid doesn't want to sit, they still can learn while they're moving. And so that's one of the broad ways you can start to figure out your child's learning thing. So it's not always like right now, how you're doing homework is not how you would be doing homeschooling. And so to me, that's the really exciting part because you really get to craft your homeschooling to your your style, to your life, to, to you, to your kid. I would argue, you know, people break my heart when they're like, what's a good curriculum for preschool? You guys, you don't need a curriculum for preschool. Just do fun things with your kids. Make Play-Doh, even if you're not the crafty mom, I'm not crafty, but there's so many things you can do. I am the science experiment mom. I have dissected everything on my kitchen table. I've had like 20 homeschoolers in my house while I dissect a fetal pig. I am the mom, like you want to blow shit up. I'm going to, I'm going to get the chemistry set and we're going to play and we're going to blow shit up. (laughs) So that's my skill. I'm not crafty, but that's okay. Find what you like to do and you don't need a curriculum. I would argue that you don't even need a curriculum for elementary school. That's your choice though. But I think there's just so much learning that can happen when you're not busy, like with a script and with books in front of you. Of course, that's that's me. Don't, <laughs> it's my podcast, so I'm giving you my opinion, but you know, you have to find your style. And in fact, you know, one thing that's interesting when I was writing, oh crap, I have a toddler, 
dude, I had deadlines. I was writing eight hours a day. And I told Pascal, I was like, man, honey, you just got to do these worksheets. I just like, I don't have time to be the creative unschooler right now. So like, I need to feel 75% good about this. I'm 75% of the process. So if I feel like I'm doing a shitty job, I'm going to be irritable. I'm going to be crazy with you. So I said, do me a favor, just do these fucking worksheets so that like I can cross it off at the end of the day. And he was like, yeah, that's cool. Like he knew it was limited. And I was, I just didn't have time to do the fun science experiments. I didn't have time to do, you know, baking and fractions and all the cool stuff. I had, I, I had to knuckle down and like work, you know, 14 hour days but that was a limited time. And and so, you know, know that you can be flexible in that kind of way too. But I, again, going back to the preschool, just read, read, love your kids, sing to them, be present, get them outside. And, and that's really enough for, for especially for preschool. You, you really don't need, you really don't need to be sitting them down and worried about their handwriting and shit like that. Okay. And then the last thing was, you know, people are really judging their ability. They want to homeschool. They might not want to homeschool. They don't want to go to school. They might want to go to school, but the digital learning went well or didn't go well. And again, I just don't think that you can base any of your decisions on how digital learning went for you in the past few months. It's just, it was just a really odd crisis schooling time. And so you know, if your kid didn't do really well with the digital learning and you want to bow out, that's that's totally cool. But don't use that as just the sole barometer because just different kids have different styles. And I, I just think we can't, we have to kind of leave that as like this moment in history that we did what we had to do, but we really can't judge. Now, I have gotten a lot of questions about unschooling because that is my style and that is what I know. And and people have asked, you know, like, how do you even start unschooling? And so I'll do just a little bit of talking about that. One of the things I love about unschooling is that my own buttons get pushed. I love, I just, I'm a why person. Like, why do we do this? Why do we do this? And when I dig into education, I mean, I think one of the most interesting things is that the subjects themselves are really arbitrary. You know, like the idea that you have to learn about the planets in second grade, somebody just decided that. So in the same vein, you get to just decide what your kids' interests are and what you're going to learn in the moment. And mostly I go with what the kid loves and what the rabbit holes are. And your kid is going to be in a rabbit hole, you know, even if they're in like a Lego rabbit hole, that's engineering, man. All the all the shit building they're doing with Legos, whether it's following directions or just free free play with Legos, engineering 100% of the way. There's so there's curriculum on Legos, you guys. There's Little House on the Prairie curriculum. There's American Girl Doll curriculum. There's <laughs> like you can find a themed curriculum. So like if your kid loves the English baking show, the British baking show, you could do a whole curriculum with baking. <laughs> so It's really interesting um, to follow these rabbit holes because you will watch your kid have grit. You will watch your kid work through frustration. One of my least favorite, you know, I said, keep, keep up is one of my least favorite phrases for education. But another one is they have to learn things they hate, that kids have to learn, you know, well, well, they have to learn how to do things they hate. And listen to that. (laughs) It's awful. And I do think kids need to learn how to work through frustration. And I think they need to learn how to work through parts of things that aren't always pleasant. Yeah. But imagine if you got to do like, and I know this is, this is a vision that's way out there, but imagine a world where you got to work in an area that you're super skilled at and you're super skilled and happy, and it makes you happy. Imagine that, like, and you know, like we all, Okay, I love obstacle course racing, endurance obstacle course racing. The training for that is fucking miserable, but I love it, right? So it's when you're working with something you're passionate about and you love, you're going to hit these spots where you have to work through a yucky part of it, right? But at least you enjoy the thing you're doing. To make a kid struggle through things they don't enjoy, there's no bonus there. So, and you're also setting your set up, there's this like, vein running through our society that we should be fucking miserable. Like listen to that on a higher, a higher level. You should be happy with things you hate. Like, yeah, they're going to have to learn how to sit. I've had people say that to me. You know, he's going to have to learn how to sit in a cubicle. 
what? What kind of fucking nonsense is that? Like, no, he could be a CEO. He could be a construction worker. Like, it's not necessarily... Like, it's just such a weird thing that we have in our society of like, well, you better get used to a job you hate. Like, think about that on a spiritual level. That drives me crazy. So, yes, you know, your kid can be passionate about something, but still work through parts that they hate. And that's that's a thing that people don't really understand. And I'll give you an example. I was very strong about a musical instrument. You had to play a musical instrument. So Pascal chose drums, which is good because he's actually tone deaf and he's good at, with rhythm. So he chose drums. Well, you know, even in drums, there's a point where you have to do drills. And and he was hating the drills, as all kids do in any musical instrument. And he was like, uh, I don't want to play drums anymore. This is boring. And I said, OK, you could quit drums, but you're going to have to take another instrument. And drills are a part of any instrument. So you're going to have to start all over again with, you know, piano. And you're going to get to a part where you hate piano. So you can either work through the drills on drums or you can work through the drums, you know, the drills on another instrument. And he was like, oh, OK, I'll work through the drills on drums because I like it. So he had to work through that boring part. Right. You know, and, and he's a, a great drum player now. But that's just an example of like he had to he had to do something he didn't love. But overall, he got to choose the instrument. Do you know what I'm saying? So make sure that you understand that concept because that's a big one in unschooling. Unschooling is really cool. If your kid's never been to school, you just kind of keep doing what you're doing. You, We have the internet, guys. You can look up the World Book of Encyclopedia has a scope and sequence of like what, what a kid should know per grade if you want to use that as a loose thing. I would just, again, I used the Jurassic Park example in my last homeschool episodes. If you haven't listened to that, I would go back and listen to that because I don't want to repeat myself. And that was a really good example of how you can sort of hit all different subjects. That's another thing is like when you follow a curriculum, the idea that math is separate from history is separate from English is a kind of crazy concept. Like you're, you're utilizing all things. This segregation of subjects is a relatively new concept. And when we look back at all the really greats, like Da Vinci is just amazing. He was a poet. He was an architect. He was an engineer. You know, all of these subjects collided. We've gotten into this groove where like, if you're an engineer, you're a nerd and you can't be good at anything else, you know? So, so there's this smearing of the subjects when you unschool. That's very, very cool. If your child has already been in school and you think you want to take them out and you want even I think you should do this even if you want to do like strict school curriculum, sit down at home. But especially if you want to unschool, there's a process called de-schooling and it's recommended that you do a month per year that your child was in school. So if you, you know, if your kid was only in school for two years, you would do two months and you just shake out all the school cobwebs. So you just don't do much of anything really. And you start learning each other's style, the rhythm and routine of your day, how your kid learns, how you like to teach, how you like to impart information. And there's a lot of like, you know, going to museums, watching movies together. It doesn't have to be, it can be educational without being like strict you know, now it's time to learn. And that's a really good thing to do. One of the things I enjoy the most about unschooling, again, is watching my own indoctrination. And I love watching my buttons being pushed, like, and questioning why, you know, like, I'll be like, well, you have to do this. And, and now that Pascal's older, he'll be like, well, why, why do, why do I have to do it this way? Why do I have to learn this particular thing right now? And I'll realize, oh, you don't. And so that goes back to the idea of like, if you're just doing this for one year, you don't have that luxury, right? You don't have that exploration. You have to do what's expected in this year per the school, because if you're going to plan on putting your kid back, they have to, again, keep up, right? So I am unabashed in my, in my love of homeschooling because I it's such a lifestyle choice. It's not just an education choice. It's such a lifestyle choice. And it's it's easy going. And I know like a lot of people say, well, you have one kid and that certainly 100% makes it easier. And I know a lot of families with other kids that unschool and you just kind of have to find what's right for you and what makes you feel comfortable. And I didn't come out of the gates unschooling. It didn't make me comfortable at all. In fact, I remember saying like, wow, those people are whack jobs. So I can understand if that's how you feel about me because <laughs> it's really, it takes a long time to come to this. It takes a long time to trust, to trust that your kid is learning, to trust that, you know, there's so many instances in homeschooling where where people don't do formal reading education and they're just always shocked. They're like, wow, my kid, my kid is a fluent reader. 
at, you know, six or seven, just like the kids in school. I know for me, I did a lot of research on boys and reading and boys tend to be later reading. And it took, it's a lot to trust in that. And I had to trust that Pascal, even though he didn't, he wasn't a strong reader when he was nine, 10, he probably, if he were in school, he would have number one, hated it, hated reading, which I think happens to a lot of our kids is when they're forced to do it, they end up hating it. And I've heard from boys, I've heard from grown men that that's what happened to them, that they wanted to read certain things or they were forced to read at a certain pace and it made them hate it. So I really backed off of reading with Pascal and and he's fine. Now he reads novels, he reads, you know, I can't say he loves reading, but he, he he's fluent and he's fine. And but it took a while. It took a while to get there. And I had to super trust that process. And that's scary. You know, I know for me, one of my things is like, OK, you know, if I need to fill in the gaps, I can always fill in the gaps later because I like to trust the process. But I know for a lot of people, that's just too scary a concept. So. I do encourage you, if you are thinking about homeschooling, to really figure out what's behind it. I don't like fear-based homeschooling at all. So if you if you really don't like the restrictions that are happening, fair game. I mean, I, I totally understand that. But also don't go into... It's really a slippery slope, I think, when you tr- when you homeschool from a place of fear because you're already on tender hooks and it's it's an out of the box choice. And so there's you're already going to have to go against people who don't like this, people who are going to judge you, family members who are going to judge you. So if you're already based in fear, it's just not going to go well. You, you really have to have the confidence and trust in the process and and trust that, you know, I've said this in in both my books, I constantly say it in my work is, you know, your kid, you are 100% the expert of your child. And so lead with that. And that's a, a place of confidence and trust that you'll figure it out. And we have resources. We just have so many resources that the world is your oyster. That's the fun part is like, you don't have to be in this one narrow path. You you really get to experience the juiciness of the whole world at your fingertips. And to me, that's the really exciting part. So with that, I'm going to log off for the day. I hope you guys have an awesome day. And again, I just want to thank you for your support. Thank you for being here. I see you. I hear you. And I so appreciate you. All right, y'all rock on. All right, I'm going to sign off for today. You can always go to jamieglowacki.com for the super cool latest updates, including the launch of my new book, Yummy New Book Presale Treats, when we release new episodes, and how to work with me directly. And of course, if you need any potty training help, there's a handy link there that will take you to all my potty training resources, including all my courses. That's the Oh Crap Potty Training online course, my pooping solutions course, and my night training supplement. And if you need additional help, how to book with a certified OCRAP consultant. That's all at jamieglowacki.com. Have a beautiful day and rock on.